Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Hey, welcome to Caravans in Context, Central America, and the History of Forced Migration. Uh, my name is Daniel Mendiola. I'm a, a professor here with CLAX, and so on behalf of, of CLAX, I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Um, so we like to begin our events um, with a sense of respect and appreciation, um, recognizing that the, the ground that we are on right now is ancestral Lenape territory. Um, we also like to begin by explaining a little bit about who we are. Um, so this event was organized by the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, um, also known as CLAX, uh, here at NYU. Now, CLAX is an academic and master's program, uh, which was designated uh, as a Title VI National Research Center, which is funded by the Department of Education, to promote an understanding of our region, uh, Latin America, through public programming. Um, for example, like tonight's events, which you are attending, um, also collaborations with K-12 education training programs, um, and, tom uh, and also by teaching less commonly taught languages uh, like Quechua and Haitian Creole. Uh, we also want to rec uh, recognize that we are streaming this event live uh, on Facebook, so we'd also like to say good evening to everyone who is joining us uh, by Facebook Live. Now, the purpose of this event um, is exactly what the title says. Um, My Big Caravans have certainly gained a lot of attention recently in the news, but mass migration in Central America, and when I say mass migration, I'm talking about migration towards the United States, but also migration within and among uh, countries in, in Central America, and also even internal migration within countries. Um, this sort of mass migration um, is not a new phenomenon in, in Central America. Um, this is, of course, part of a long and complicated history, um, and that long and complicated history shapes the situation that we're seeing today. So the purpose of our event is sort of to explore a bit more of, of the history that's sort of affecting the situation that we find ourselves in now, um, and also to talk about the current situation as well, um, in order to put things into a better context. Um, and one thing that I do want to say, I think, at the, at the outset of this event, is probably the most important part of this context um, for me and I think for, for our other um, other speakers as well. Um, is that when we're talking about migration, we're not talking about some sort of abstract or, or theoretical policy debate. I and mean, we're talking about something that's actually happening with real human beings, with real people. Um, and there's, there's real lives and livelihoods at stake uh, every time we talk about this topic. Um, so I think the, the number one thing that we, need to, that we need to establish here is that when we're talking about the context of care events, um, this context is deeply human. Um, and you're going to see that, uh, I think, reflected very well in the film. Um, okay, so essentially, here's the order of the events for tonight. Um, you won't be hearing too much from me. I'm going to get out of the way as soon as possible so that we can hear from our speakers. So we do have two guest speakers who will be speaking tonight. Um, we're going to begin with a brief address from Carlos Sandoval, um, who was one of the producers of the documentary film that we're, we're going to be looking at tonight. Um, after Carlos's opening address, we're going to show the first part of the film, uh, which is about 35 minutes, and we're going to have a follow-up address by our second guest speaker, um, Carla Garcia, um, who did not participate in making the film, but she has a lot of very unique insights and first-hand experience with the themes that are addressed in the film, um, so we're very lucky to have her here. Um, to give her address as well. Um, then after Carlos' address, then of course we'll um, bring them both of our speakers up for a panel. Uh, I will ask them a few questions and they will also take questions from the audience. Um, and then we will have also a brief reception um, after the event. And so you may get a chance to talk to, uh, if you have some additional follow-up questions and would like to meet the speakers. Um, okay, so let me begin by introducing our first speaker, Carlos Sandoval. And Carlos is a professor and researcher at the University of Costa Rica. Um, he has a long list of scholarly publications, um, including an award-winning book in 2008 called Otros Amenazantes, or The Threatening Others, um, which talks about the perceptions of Nicaraguan immigrants in Costa Rica. Um, also, a more recent um, 2015 book, No Mas Muros, um, which is the uh, book that the documentary film is largely based on. Um, both of these books are available in English translations. Um, they are in the NYU library, and my master's students are reading both of them uh, in their class this semester. Um, in addition to being a very productive scholar, Carlos is also the founder of a local nonprofit organization in San Jose called Merienda y Zapatos, uh, which provides support to immigrant families and asylum seekers in Costa Rica. 
Um, this is actually how I first met uh, Carlos myself. So I first met Carlos in 2017 uh, when I was in Costa Rica doing research for my dissertation. Uh, and a friend of mine told me about Merienda and invited me to volunteer uh, and help out with the tutoring program on Saturdays. Um, I remember the first day that I showed up, Carlos was there. Uh, he was also tutoring. Um, can't remember exactly what we were tutoring that day. It's probably fractions or, or, or middle school math or something like that. Um, since that time, um, Carlos has grown into a great colleague, a uh, great mentor, um, and I think I would say a uh, friend. And so it was an honor to invite him to the podium to give his opening address. Uh, good evening. Uh, thanks for coming uh, uh, this this evening. Um, I would like to thank, first of all, to Clax for being able to uh, invite me uh, for the second time here. And it was you. I, I was here 15 years ago talking about the, a book on Nicaraguan migration to Costa Rica. And I am really pleased to share with you some reflections on Central American migration. Um, as I, uh, Daniel said, um, we are going to have a screening of a half an hour of, of the documentary whose title is Home in a Foreign Land, um, which is uh, based on the book uh, No Man Muros, No More Walls, which is the Spanish, by the way, the Spanish edition is uh, available on the web. And the, the documentary is a result of a team work, as you can imagine. Producing a documentary involves a lot of people with different skills and, and, and capacities. And, and we are very pleased to, to have finished the documentary, to put it in, in, the, in, in YouTube, so you, you can download the, the documentary in, on the web. And trying to be more interactive with wider audiences, which is always a challenge for those working at universities. We, we need to, to address non-specialized uh, publics, which are not always uh, interested in uh, reading more or less uh, uh, non very interested, very interested in suggesting articles. So <laughs> uh, uh, we 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 thought that perhaps a documentary will, will be a, a way of of putting Central America in in a in in the focus of, of of these times when the war attention is not located in Central America like it was twenty five. 35 years ago, when there was a war in, in Central America. Um, probably um, the main idea of the documentary, as you can um, see in a moment, is that nowadays uh, migration is, a, is an almost an, an obligation in Central America. It's not an, an election, rather it's an, it's an obligation. And this is why force is an adjective which characterize migration nowadays. And, the, and the, on the other hand, people find very hard to cross Mexico, as you probably know very well, and even more difficult to cross the border between the Mexico and the States. So there is a sort of trump between uh, spelling population, on the other hand, the, the laws, law enforcement, and externalization of borders that characterize the U.S. policy uh, in, uh, nowadays. The, the documentary uh, is organized around three topics. The first one is the one we are going to, to screen uh, now, which is the, the whole issue of structural exclusion in Central America that obliges people to, to leave their countries. The second topic uh, is the politics of enforcement, law enforcement, which has a number of, of ways of, of, of trying to, to, to impede that people cross the border. And the, and the third topic, and the last topic of the documentary, is the politics of hope. It, that uh, tell us uh, that despite many difficulties, 
uh, solidarity and hospitality is around, and this is this is the the kind of of ending we we try to portray in the documentary. But uh, for a moment we are going to screen the, the first 30 minutes, and of course I, I will be very pleased to exchange views with you after that. Thanks very much. Please welcome Carla Garcia. Good evening, everyone. As my colleague said, my name is Carla Garcia. Um, it's my second time with having this opportunity, seeing the, the documentary, and I still feeling touch about uh, the last word from the Salvadorian lady, because it's an extract about what is happening inside of our communities, inside of our family houses, because we can um, receive a lot of information about people coming through the border to inside of the United States, but we don't know their history and why they are doing that. Um, I want to apologize, and I told to um, my friends here that when I'm going to start saying things, when I say things, is because I don't know how to pronounce the word or how to, to um, say it in, 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 in English. Um, it's important to have a real conversation about immigration. United States is touching all the subjects about immigration, but it's not going to the roof. Why the problem is coming to us? Why? Because uh, everybody said that it's an economical problem for the United States. Um, immigrants are filling up all the, the courts. They are coming through the border. They are... Um, as Donald Trump said, immigrants are um, violadores, they are um, delinquentes, but nobody is asking why our people is coming through the border with their children to this country. And we need to review, for example, the history of Honduras, the bananeras, history started with that kind of immigration but also 2013 was a very good um, room to understand why this big interest around the world including the United States are working together to get up to put it out from our land Ofrane is one of the organization who is who will continue fighting for the land ladies and gentlemen in 10 maybe 11 12 years we are not going to be able to eat in the United States because food is not longer so food is not enough for everybody we the indigenous and black people back in Central America or in our countries, how we have the land and they are moving us by purpose to get those land and sell to us the food that is will, will be in need in the future. We Everybody, we are talking about development. Um, we are talking about these um, big hotels in our communities. But if you go and see our history, 25 years fighting against the people who will install a big hotel or resort, only three resorts in 20 years. But they already have almost all the land that we conserve or we was having from the past. That means that they don't want our land for, for, 
for um, hotels or for that big uh, buildings. They want the land for something else. I want to call to your attention because I know the time will be very, very short about the project of um, North Triangle. This project is um, auspiciado, sponsored by. sponsored by the United States. In this project, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras will give part of their land to different countries to develop or to do whatever they want. But will be a land or a country inside of another country. From where is the people who is coming through the border? From this special part of lands in our countries that they will put in, in North Triangle, in the, and the North Triangle plan. So that means that the indigenous communities and black communities from those three countries will be displaced. There's an opportunity crossing the border and waiting for a case in the United States. An opportunity, opportunity for them because they will not go into return until they have a no-no from the court of the United States. I worked in 2013 and 2014 with the first big um, group of women and kids um, the migration from, from my communities. And they still waiting for a real court from 2013. But they don't go back to Honduras because they think that maybe in one or two years they're going to have this real court and they will get the papers to live legally into the United States. So everything that I saw here is bring to bring into me all my experience and all the experience that I know from other people, some by, people living here, people who already was the porter, and people who is dreaming to come to the United States. Thank you. Okay, so to begin this conversation, so I'm going to ask our uh, esteemed guests a few questions and give them a chance to answer, and then, of course, we'll have a chance for the, the audience to ask questions as well. Um, okay, so to begin, let me ask the first question to, to Carlos. Um, I was hoping you could tell us a little about the, the research um, that, that went into, of course, the book, Namas Moros, and then also this, this film. Yeah. Yes, uh, well, I, I, I began, I think, in the year 2013, traveling through the region. Um, probably the, the main concern was why, if it is so difficult to enter to Mexico and cross in the border, people were still trying to reach Mexico. Uh, and then, the main answer for that question was that, on the one hand, there is a structural exclusion in, in the region. Second, criminal violence has been raising a lot. Uh, gender violence as mm -hmm. well. And it, especially in the case of Honduras, uh, <coughs> uh, the, the, the political class has been unable to guarantee, let's say, even the reproduction of, of the system that allows them to rule. I mean, there is a kind of crisis of legitimacy mm. of, the, of the government and the, and the exclusion that have been prevailing, which, is a, which comes with this idea of failed states, mm. which is quite risky because it's, it's a sort of justification for military interventions and the like. But this is the, the kind of concerns that I, I, I had in mind at, the mo at, at that time. Mm -hmm. And then I, I realized that the huge uh, culture of, of hospitality and solidarity 
which is present in Mexico in different shelters and initiatives and the, the ways in which that despite the, 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 the lack of interest of the official government, the previous one, and now you know the, the current one is taking a very controversial uh, position regarding migration, people in the local communities are able to organize by themselves in order to foster uh, shelters and other uh, other uh, kind of 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 chances for the people who are crossing Mexico. Uh, this 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 contrast between exclusion and solidarity is a kind of driving uh, 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 guide for the book and also for the 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 second and the third part of the documentary. Yes, and again, I would like to point out that um, this was only the first part of the documentary. So as, as Carlos is discussing the, the theme of hospitality and um, the actual migrant route, so I encourage you all to, the, the film is available on YouTube for free. Um, and I would encourage all of you to, to watch the rest of the film. Um, the second question that I think I would like to ask both of you, um, hopefully to speak on, um, and you can, you can give your answer in English or you can switch to Spanish if, if you would like. Um, but the, the question of this, this migration being forced, this migración forzada, um, seemed to be a theme, a very recurring theme in, in the film that we just watched. So I would like to hear both of you talk a little bit about why that's an appropriate term to use, or, or in, in, in your minds, why should we characterize or call this, this, this migration forced or forzada? Either one of you can go first. Yeah. Well, well I, I just want to say that uh, uh, probably one of the main conclusions of, of recession migration nowadays is that for most of the people who, who leave the countries, it's, it's not an, an option, it's an obligation. And, and because of civil war in Syria or in, in Afghanistan or in, in, or in the case of here, in, 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 I mean in Central America, and people coming to here, it's, it's, it's the, the there is a necessity to leave the leave the countries. Uh, so forced migration is a, I mean, is 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 in a way is a way of conceptualizing what is going on, and probably the the what what we didn't expect that it was that at the time when migration became an obligation, simultaneously uh, law enforcement took place which is a kind of very sad story that when people needed to leave, now become more and more difficult to do that. And this is Central America nowadays. Yeah, what I can say is that um, the conditions for the mig migration in in Central America are created by this, the, the governments. And they are doing this f by purpose. We know how many um, cases against diputados, presidentes, against everybody in the political class are inside of the countries and outside of the countries. <coughs> um, the resources are getting are going to a few hand hands and the rest of or the majority of the people in every country is trying to survive literally but also they create this dream about come to the united states nobody is my is making um the decision to go to guatemala Oh, in the mountains in Guatemala, there's a beautiful space for us to raise our kids or to do. No, nobody is going back to the south. Why? If Costa Rica have a be best way to receive immigrants, why immigrants are not going to Costa Rica? Why all immigrants? don't want to finish her travel or her, their trip in Mexico. Why do they want to cross the border? Why if um, Canada offer to the immigrants to go and live in Canada, 
why the immigrants don't want to go to Canada. There's a marketing very, very well established to let us know that the only place to live is the United States. And they are forcing us mentally, psycholog psychologically, to come here, to live on one land, and to come and pick the dollars when it's knowing, because this is the, the, the imagination or what is coming through their minds, that everything is easy here. And that happened in 2013. People went in my communities, not one, all my communities. We have 47 Garifuna communities. And tell to the mothers in their houses or went at the schools, go to the United States, pick your son. When you cross the border, you can apply for school and after that, Obama will do everything for you. And we have the first big, big migration from our communities, mothers and child. So then the young people started to get the trip to the United States. If you as a community are fighting against the people who want to get the land, the first thing that you need is mothers in reproductive and healthy uh, age and young people. If you only have elders in your community, you will no longer will be, a, be able to, to fight for your community. So it's force also, and I want to talk about that part, um, the gangs, the maras. It's true. In the cities, and I'm going to talk about my community, the Garifuna community. In the cities, Tegucigalpa, San Pedro Sula, and all the big cities, the maras are there. And the, they are doing what you know they do. But in our communities, that's not true. In our communities, it's the government. It's the military force of the government. It's the uh, developers. This is the people who is taking us out from our communities because they need the land. I'm still saying that, and I will say that by the end of the, the, this, uh, this night. They need our territory. They need our space. And they are forcing us to leave us. Thank you. Um, I think the, the the point that you you made about the psychological being forced psychologically, um, I think is a brilliant point because one of the things that I thought was most I think powerful about this film is that it puts into perspective. Um, I think there's kind of an idea that this is only an economic issue, right? Like if it's forced, it's only because there's not jobs or something like that. But I think one of the things that's, that's very brilliant about this film is it puts into perspective, um, it's not just about economics. It is forced on a lot of other levels as well. Um, so I, w I would actually like to hear both of you talk a little bit about the, the role of the, the government, right? Because I think we could also say it's, it's economically forced, psychologically forced, and politically um, forced um, as well. So I. I would like to hear both of you talk a little about what you think is the, the role of the government and to what extent this is politically forced as well. Well, um, I am not sure how able are the governments in Central America to orchestrate a hmm. collective decision to leave. I mean, life is enough disorganized. I mean, is, we are not talking about states able to carry out big projects in any sense. But perhaps which is present in the region is the, a deep sense of fear. I mean, not, not necessarily and directly organized by governments, but the sense of fear drives people out. Extortion is an huge industry in Central America, especially in Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. People need to pay for crossing the street, uh, to go to the supermarket, to the school, to the church, and, and so on. So, I mean, uh, um, now we just finish up electoral period in Central America, which began in Honduras in the year 2017, and 
and that last year in Guatemala with the second round and and, and we 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 see in Central America is, is that governments are far away of uh, coping with the demands of the people. I, after the documentary, I worked in a project which was organized around a survey with young people in uh, one community for each of the capitals of Central America. And half of the people who joined the survey would leave their countries if they have the chance to do that. 50% of 1,500 uh, uh, people w uh, who responded to the survey uh, organized by were young people, right? Young people organized by quotas, taking into consideration age, sex, and if they are if they were studying or working. So half of the survey people say we we leave the country if we have a chance. So uh, yes, the, as, as you mentioned it before, most of the media attention is located around caravans, but when there are no caravans, people are leaving the countries as well. I mean, tonight in San Pedro Sula, I don't know, six up to seven buses will leave the city trying to reach the, the border between Honduras and, and Guatemala. So in, in a way, <coughs> caravans, uh, crystallize media attention, but we can't say that without caravans, people are not living. It's, it's a kind of, I mean, uh, uh, exclusion is structural in the region, and, and probably the, the, the most depressing thing is that we don't have a long-term view of how to assure that people may have um, access to opportunities. Uh, uh, living in, in the country. Perhaps we need that in, in a way, uh, let's say, uh, a right not to have to migrate in the first place. How to translate this right not to have to migrate into public policies is the, the thing that currently governments are unable to accomplish. Uh, for me, um, the governments are part of the plan. We cannot say that they don't know what is happening and why it's happening in our communities and in our countries. For example, when kids are coming out from the border of Honduras, if you are traveling legally from Honduras to wherever you want to go, you have to present the birth certificate of the kid, the birth certificate of the grandmother of the dog of the kid, every paper you have to present it to take out from the country this kid. But if you are coming in a caravan, you have to pass through the border, no matter what. There's a border in, in, in um, la frontera between El Salvador or between Guatemala and Honduras. Why those kids are not required or those parents are not required to present the same documents? Migration means money for a lot of people. Inside of our countries, in the United States, in Guatemala, in wherever they take the trip, it means money. Here, courts with a lot of enough people for the judges, people having wearing the, the grillete, the ankle brace, um, a lot of people trying to make new rules in the United Nations, etc. That means money. For the gangs, they are um, asking for the impuesto de guerra. I don't know what is the name, if it has, has a name in in English, if you want to pass through my, um, my side, you have to pay for it. Back in our countries, they, there's people giving loans to the caravanistas. I will give you 5000 or $500 dollars 
when you started you have to start to work in United States and you're going to pay me back a hundred percent more than I gave to you it everywhere means money it means money for the government if the government already offered the land if the government already is offering mano de obra what is the name labor in different countries come on let's be honest United Nations have a, this big project about safe um, safe countries this is not a project it's not a new project and we know that refugees from different countries when my country accept refugees will receive money too because we are accepting these people in my land in my in, in, in my property so now, because the Carolines, nobody can control the Carolines, Mexico became a safe place for the, they are receiving money. So they can put the, 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 the wall and that let people come to the United States. But now it's not enough. El Salvador said, oh, we too. Money for El Salvador. And it's the same thing. Now Honduras is a, a safe country. These are government policies here. Right. Yes. So government is part of this thing. They are taking from our people whatever they can do, they can take out, and they don't care if your family or my family is dying, waiting to come into the United States. So for me, yes, they are part of the problem. Um, well, I think a, a lot of people in this room, um, students, professors, or myself included, um, are from the United States, but we, we're, we're studying this issue, the issue of, of Central America and, and migration. So I would like to give both of you a chance. Just, just what advice do you have for, for people like me um, who are starting to, study this, uh, starting to study this issue? Well, perhaps my, my main suggestion is to avoid a certain division of work within academia that means that those who are in the States are more related with people who are who already here. And, and those who work like me on migration in the uh, uh, countries of origin are less connected with what is going on in the States, for instance. I mean, we, 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 I, I, I think we need a more cooperative way of working on migration. And, and also, I think we need to know more about the ways in which migration has been politicized in countries like the States or the European Union. It's, it's quite impressive how migration became the main topic of conversation during elections. Um, last week in Germany, for the first time, the far right is in a regional government. Alternative for Germany, or alternative for Deutschland is in the government, and now the Angela Merkel is 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 upset with their own her own party because they accepted the uh, alternative for Germany in government. So, I mean, on the one hand, we have the 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 dynamics of migration, and in the other, we have this kind of 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 migration being a point of articulation of, of the right and the far right movements, which is quite important. It, it, it's, it's the, the, more, the, the, the ways in which migration became the, the raw material for politics. And this is a very risky moment for, for our societies, I would say. So, in short, I, I think we need more conversation between those who work on migration in, in, in receiving countries and those who are working in, in countries of origin, for instance. Yeah. Thank you. I saw the migration and the problem like a big spider with a many patitas. And uh, Maybe, yes, maybe, because I'm not feel like in, in, enough big to give advices. But it's important to know 
all these patitas. And one person cannot take all the patitas together to know in what way is going the, the spider, right? So in the politic, politic area, just imagine, we move a big contingent of people from Honduras to live in Guatemala. They are in a safe country in Guatemala. We move Guatemalans for, to El Salvador. And we move people from El Salvador, even from Mexico to Honduras. What do we have in the region? region? We cannot choose a president. We cannot fight against nobody because our people is divided in countries where they cannot decide for. Is one of the patitas, right? Here in the United States, the mothers who is coming through the borders, may, they may not, it's more probably they will not going to have, by the end of the process, legal documentation, and they will be returned to our countries. But they came with kids, and kids have rights in the United States. And after a certain time of years living here, they became automatically in citizens. This um, family separation is coming, not only in the border. This is a new patita of the problem. So maybe politics, science, um, migration, health, about mental health, and what is happening with all these people who is being moved. So every area can take a piece or a patita to study everything and put it together. It's the only way that we, are re we will really understand what is the problem, why is the problem, and how to attack the problem. Because I can talk about what I know, but there's many people who know more about the problem and it needs to be addressed. Thank you. Um, I think I do want to, before we transition into the, the questions from the audience, uh, which will be coming soon. Uh, I want to give both of you a chance to talk about um, the work that you do uh, outside of the academy. And so I, want to, I would like to hear you, um, Carlos, talk a little bit more about Merienda and, and sort of how that came about, what you do. And then, of course, I would like to hear a, lot of, a bit more about Ofrane and um, what you do uh, with our organization. So. Well, um, in San Jose, Costa Rica, we, we work with uh, <coughs> children and young people with a from, from Nicaraguan background. I, I have to say that uh, despite the fact that most of political debate on migration refers to South to North migration, almost half of international migration is from South to South migration. And in the case of Latin America, probably the, the Nicaraguan migration to Costa Rica is one of the most prominent cases. So we work with children, uh, helping them not to be excluded from the formal education uh, uh, schools. And, and we have been doing this for now almost se 17 years. And, and it's, it's, it's hard to believe when you see a teenager who began in primary school and now um, get a chance to go to universities. It's, it's a huge. Uh, um, experience and uh, by the way when now I took the opportunity to come here to also to buy a computer for our one of the young students who got a place at the University of Costa Rica starting in, in a month and it, her, her, her career so uh, I think working in the university we think, I think that we need to be able to combine, let's say, academic work with a more civic engagement kind of uh, um, of, um, of challenges. I mean, this this whole industry of publish or perish and end of story is is not the the best way to justify for what 
a university is useful in a society. I think this 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 um, more engaged kind of <coughs> being um, in a university is is more, in my opinion, at least more productive, more uh, more connected with with real um, questions, and not only uh, being in in the small conversation, which is usually interesting for a very few people. Uh, but of course, also universities, all this uh, cultural competition is around, and, and, and probably civic engagement is not a priority. But I think um, doing that uh, for many years have allowed me to know more about the why people uh, leave the countries and and also how to to contribute to fulfill their dreams and to try to to support them for instance in terms of formal education and and I think I have been learning a lot uh, uh, from the, the the experience of the families who 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 used to, to go to Costa Rica and um, because like Honduras in Nicaragua has has had a very difficult period of during the last two years uh, they have been a deep political crisis um, I mean overall Central America is in, is, is, is a, in, in a very difficult position I mean is Central America Central America is not in the from pages of the of the media, like in the 80s, but the the, the situation is is quite similar. Even nowadays, we have more uh, um, homicides than during the period of the war in the 80s. But but the geopolitics is have changed a lot, and, and now priorities are in 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 other places. But uh, <laughs> I think more civic engagement could be a, a, a it's, it's a good learning based on my own experience. Thank you. Um, I'm part of the process. Um, my organization, our organization, your organization, Ofrane, is based in Honduras and we our main um, topic our main uh, space to work for us is the land our pertinence to the land land is ours land is the mother land is everything but now we have immigration problem, uh, we have um, youth development, we have um, sex, um, sexual orientation problems. We are attacking, we also um, work with elderly people, women, and uh, different organizations from out of our country, Guatemala, um, Belize, people from um, Colombia, Puerto Rico, we are trying to work together because we are, um, we have identified that the problem is almost the same everywhere for the indigenous and, and black communities. So we are trying to connect our experience. This is what we do. We continue fighting for the land of the Garifuna community in Honduras, and we are trying to share our experience with all, all um, other people who want to know how we do it and how can they do something, maybe kind of what we did it. Cool. Um, I'll invite all of you to uh, give a round of applause, I think, first off for our friends and speakers. Uh, I think at this time, we're going to open it up to questions to the audience. So um, please, to, just to make sure everyone can hear you, uh, please dive into the microphone and it'll come around. Hi. Um, thank you both so much. This was wonderful. I was wondering, 
particularly you, Ms. Garcia, you spoke a lot about development. And so I was wondering, is there something that's changing in the type of development that is happening that is causing greater displacement? Or is this more of like a continuation of, of development strategies that displace people that we have been seeing for the last 60 years or something like that? The strategy is the same, but we don't see the advance, the, the an initial construction, the first stone, something, no. The only two resources, no, three, I think. One is in Tela, mm -hmm. the resort that we saw here. One is in the Atlantida, in La, near La Ceiba. And the other one in a small um, level is one from the Canadian in, in, in Trujillo. So everybody is going to your community, and I want you to imagine that, coming to your community when the government declared the land uh, in, near the mountain as a national park and you cannot go back and utilize the land to um to, to plant mm -hmm. to plant the yuca or whatever you need to do uh for for to put your food in in, in the so then you want to go to utilize the la the, the sea and you cannot no longer uh, allow to go and fish, right? So then you want to go and to find a job, and the government is not giving jobs to nobody. Government don't remember even the name of your community. And after that, so one the de big develop white man with uh, white hair beautiful, rare, uh, no, sorry, blue eyes. <laughs> I'm thinking the devil. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's coming to you and make a, a big meeting and say, oh, I have the key. You can sell to me the land and I will give to you the job that you need to raise your family. But that never happened. The people, if I said no, he had big friends in the government, and the government will, will tell me, you have to do it, you know, we are going to take it out. But look in Honduras, in Honduras history, the last 20 years, how many um, buildings are constructed in that land? None. And this is a real problem, because they don't want the land to develop or to do new, to put new buildings or research or everything is a lie. They are keeping the land. So now the um, North Triangle project will buy land to a lot of people. They already have the land. They will sell the land to the project. How much that's what they call it? development. Yes. Yes, I don't know if it's enough. Perfect, thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, we have a question. Is there another question? Yeah. Here? Maybe a question oh, in the back, yeah, and then we'll come to the floor. Thank you. Um, hi, good night. I'm from Honduras, actually. So, hola. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I've been working also on forced migration, but more specifically on the urban area of Honduras and in urban neighborhoods. So I wanted to touch upon something that Carla mentioned. Um, as you said, uh, in Honduras, the forced displacement is more visible when enforced uh, from the state in rural communities. But I also believe that in urban communities, the role has a very strong uh, role that it's playing on this displacement because gangs did not happen on a vacuum. They respond to a lack of state presence. So what we can see is that these urban neighborhoods, for example, they also experience lack of land tenure, for example. Being in formal settlements, nobody there has a piece of paper that tell them this is my house. So they live in a constant state of fear or of being evacuated. 
And well, my point to all of this is how have these governments succeeded in being in place for so long? When, for example, in Honduras, we can see that we are, we have already 10 years after a coup fighting on the streets, protesting, but still um, there is no international response to our reply. And I also want to touch upon the 2017 elections where most of the country protested after the content results, but the US embassy declared that they accepted the president and the elections, and I think that was kind of saying the end of it all. So I was wondering on how would you um, reflect on how this bilateral rela relations affect migration and how can we work upon these bilateral relations? Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, I think in human areas, the, the reason why people leave the countries are a bit different, and as you say, uh, fear is a, is, a, is a driving force for, for living the country. I, I think that the other element that we, we haven't mentioned, which is the territorial disputes around illicit uh, substances, which is a, a very complex reality in the communities. Uh, because of the agreements between the US government and the Colombian government, uh, now they are m more, um, the, it's more difficult to cross the, the um, Caribbean uh, with, with illicit substances. And now most of them cross Central America. And there are lots of s small portion of the substances which remain in the communities. And there are lots of disputes around who is selling to whom. Uh, this is the case of Costa Rica as well. So I would say that uh, we have had always structural uh, uh, violence. Now we have the combination of structural violence with criminal violence, which is relatively new in our context. Now they've just taken the case of Costa Rica, Half of homicides in Costa Rica are committed because of territorial disputes. Uh, and how to go beyond that is not very easy, because you know it's, uh, illicit substances are ingrained in, in this society, and, and, and they, they need to cross from Colombia to, to the US. How to, to go beyond that, I don't know. And so this combination, combination between structural violence and criminal violence and gender violence, which is the, the terror element in, in this context, is, is quite complex. And on, on top of that, there is corruption. I mean, the, the erosion of legitimacy of the government is, is, is increasing. I mean, uh, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a situation in which People do not trust in politicians. Uh, uh, for instance, in, in the latest election in El Salvador, m about half of the population didn't vote. Um, and yesterday, uh, this president of El Salvador took the parliament in a very unusual way, even for Salvadoran standards. Uh, um, so it's, 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 the, it's the case that, on the one hand, there are huge demands for inclusion, justice, and on the other, there is, there is this political class enabled to provide responses to the people, and corruption is pervasive, either in the right or in the left, because the, the Frente Farabundo Martí has a huge uh, uh, um, file of corruption, and not to say the Sandinistas, which uh, I have, have been profiting from the making the, the, the history of revolution in a new, uh, uh, new merchandise kind of thing. Uh, so in that context, uh, exit, meaning forced migration, is one of the few, so to speak, alternatives for the people. Es, 
es bien interesante. It's very interesting, sorry. I forgot. Um, we, the Garifuna communities, are located in the Caribbean of Honduras. And narco-traffickers are one of our biggest enemies. But here in the New York court, the brother of the president have a fight, lost the case because he's a narco-trafficking. Government is part of the narco-trafico in Honduras. So we don't have the money. We don't have the land. We don't have the political um, force. We don't have nothing. But we're still fighting against everything. And if you saw this lady in the documentary, she said, my husband left the country. She's still there. And this is the same situation for the women in the Garifuna communities. Maybe men are leaving the country, are leaving the city. Women still fighting for. Why is my question. If the government is involved with, with proof in narco trafico, because your mother, your, sorry, your sister, your brother, your cousin, everybody around, uh, everybody is narco trafficking, and you, the president, you're not. So why all these people, all these people is, is bringing to United States, to the court in the United States, and the president is not touched by this government. This is a big question. Why are they need from him? Because then, by the end of the day, he's coming to the court of New York and to the yelling New York, right? But why not now? Because he continue giving this facility for this big um, business that is immigration, because he's still giving away the land, because he is selling the country in pieces. We need to think about that too. Okay. Let's continue. Next question. Oh yeah. Oh, this is this has been a wonderful evening so far. I mean, it's just fantastic. Congratulations on the film and um, the indigenous experiences. It's really important to bring it. Um, I'm, I work on the NGO Committee on Migration at the, in, at the United Nations, and I co-convene a subcommittee on migrant and refugee children. And I saw your I saw your eyes light up when you spoke about the power of education and how it can change lives. It's transformative. You've seen that. And I'm wondering about the value that's given to education in Central America in general and how there are mothers who leave. So if they migrate out, children are staying behind maybe with grandmothers and there are mothers who are staying behind because husbands or partners leave and they're there raising children. I mean, what about, what could be the role of early childhood development programs that address the trauma, because there's a lot of trauma involved, and yet they they address also the educational needs from of the littlest children. And those children can put all of that in their backpack and take them with them. No one can steal education from them. If you start really when they're very small, what what is the feeling there about programs like that? Is it possible Maybe the government isn't providing education programs like that, but are there faith-based groups on the ground, NGOs, that would do this or are doing this? Just a question. Yeah, well, I would say there are many initiatives. Uh, we have been talking more on power, but 
I must say that there are, there are also many initiatives regarding um, networking of support and solidarity. I mean, here, of course, in the States, there are many. In the, on the border, in cities, in sanctuary cities, which is an experience based on people from El Salvador during the 80s. So, uh, yeah, but in the case of education, I, I think that probably one of the main challenges in Central America is how to convince um, the political class that investment in education is investment in opportunities. Uh, this is the, the only long-term way of uh, overcoming uh, exclusion. And, and the, the, the trouble is that they don't recognize that only investing in opportunities will warrant us a more inclusion uh, and more equity. Um, yeah, this is a. At the end of the day, it, this is this is the long-term view which is missing in Central America. I mean, they they say, well, we need to. We we have this this um, hard line policy on gangs, for instance. But this is, I mean, this is not drive you to anywhere. I mean, this is not a solution. But of course, investment in the opportunities is not a uh, short-term kind of strategy. And they, they are looking for something uh, quick and, and cheap. And, and investment is a, a long-term process. Um, but despite that, uh, in a way, I am optimistic that, that when, when you say, when you, you can see, for instance, families in which uh, now there is the first member of the family who is going to university. The first, uh, uh, some time ago I had a conversation with one of the mothers of the children with, with, uh, which uh, joined the, the initiative in, in, in which I met uh, Danielle. And, and the, the, uh, I told her, well, look, despite the all difficulties, you 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 were until third grade in primary school. Now your eldest son is finishing secondary school. I mean, now he he has been in school more the double of years that you were uh, at, your, uh, at the time. So it's it's a big difference. Of course, I, I'm not saying that everything is is going fine, but what I'm I'm suggesting is that at the same time that there is a big gray zone of pessimism around migration and politics, there are many initiatives at the local level. Because I think being always only in the negative side is a is a is a very uh, is a very is an effective way of of demobilization. I mean, th thinking that everything uh, is under the umbrella of pessimism is 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 not politically motivating for doing things. So uh, at the time, at the same time, I am pessimistic. I think at the local level there are many initiatives, and 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 we we still need to do more on that. Uh, yeah, especially in, the, in terms of creating opportunities through education. Um, and I have seen wonderful experiences of children who have almost nothing in terms of, of, of supporting, and they have been able to, to go through formal education because they, they think it's the, the only way they, have, they can have a chance. Mm -hmm. So they, they are also resources of hope. In short, yeah. Okay, have next question. Um, yeah. Hola. Oh, you're gonna just a little. Okay. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> um. Hola, anticipado. <laughs> I'm agree, and I'm totally convinced that we need more education in our countries, 
in our communities for our kids. My problem is the type of education. Because if you will show to a kid how to um, utilize these 3D uh, printers, and they will not going to have a space to work in Honduras, you're doing nothing. And I want to talk about, uh, away from the pessimism, I want to talk about one of the big, big experience that we have. It's called Vallecito. It's really inside in, in Cologne. It's a land that we are recovering. And we have a school. Um, often it is providing full um, roof and everything that the people need, I I inclusive um, health, health care. So the kids are going out to the land every day to plant, to learn what is the movement of the land, to learn about the moon, to learn about the rivers, learn about the sea, when they can go to fish, but also they are going to the school. And it's a real big difference because they now, you can ask to those kids things that only, and I've started to say things, <laughs> that only the elders was, was elders. yeah. So now they, we are recovering our culture in the same process when we, when we are <laughs> showing the kids how to live in outside world too. So that kind of education, invest in that kind of education, I'm agree. I'm the first. Hola. Hola, eh, muchas gracias por, lo, por la charla que dieron hoy. Hace falta que venga alguien a decir la verdad. Um, can I do it in English or Spanish? Either one's fine. Ok, thank you. Eh, gracias. Eh, mi pregunta es, ¿cómo crees que se pueda cambiar el estereotipo idealista que solo se puede migrar a Estados Unidos, ya que Estados Unidos es un país en cual está completamente en contra eh, los inmigrantes, especialmente los latinos, y es como, y ellos siguen implementando que el único sitio en cual se puede buscar como esperanza es si van para Estados Unidos, y especialmente a nuestras generaciones. Así que es para saber cómo tú crees que puedan cambiar eso. Uh, español <risa> bueno yo diría primero que más o menos la mitad de la migración internacional es de un país del sur a otro país del sur ¿Verdad? el 45-50% de toda la migración que además no es mucha es apenas el 3% de la población mundial total es migrante internacional la retórica de la migración hace parecer que son muchos los migrantes, pero es apenas el 3% de la población mundial total. Eh, eh, yo, yo diría que hay mucha migración de sur a sur en África, el mayor campo de personas que han buscado refugio están en Uganda, eh, la mayor parte de las personas que salieron de Siria están en Líbano, no está en la Unión Europea. <laughs> As a crisis of refugees. This is not a crisis. I mean, the, the total percentage of uh, asylum seekers in, in the European Union is less than 0.1% of the total Europe, European Union population. <laughs> so the, there is a, also a fabric of referee regarding migration. And, and uh, so it is n not always people come to the States. This is the kind of narrative that has been so persuasive and say too many people is coming to here, so we, they are a threat, and therefore we need to build the wall. This is a, a very, very persuasive narrative. I think it's not the case. I mean, in terms of demographics, it's not the case. Um, on the other hand, we may say, well, how can we frame a progressive politics on migration? How to think that immigration is a, is a right? 
I mean, humanity has been migrating through the centuries. You have in biblical, uh, bi biblical terms, sorry, sorry about that, <laughs> with the uh, language shift, I forgot the microphone. <laughs> uh, so migration has been, through history, a, a reality. Uh, perhaps what, what, what is new in modern times is that with the establishment of states as, 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 a, as a main ways of organizing territories, the, f the category of migrant took place. Before the states, people who move were not considered migrants. <laughs> So the subject of migration is a political construction. It's, it's not a, um, let's say, natural um, entity or something like that. Uh, so on the one hand, they are more or less half of the total worldwide migration from south to south. On, on the other, we have this huge challenge of saying if migration has been that historical process, why do we find so difficult that people could cross a border? A century ago, I mean, the, 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 the requirement for passports to enter in the US has only a century. <laughs> so in, in historical terms, it's, it's quite recent. <laughs> it's not a long-term. Um, issue. Um, so in, sh in short, I think w we need to analyze the demographics of migration, but also the politics of migration. And this second area is even more complicated, I think, because now the politics of migration is ingrained in, in the, this whole right and far right initiatives and movements here, even in Costa Rica. Two years, almost two years ago, we have a march against migration. And a week later, we march for solidarity and for peace. In a, in a very, very well-known and reputed country uh, like Costa Rica, about 500 people marched, marched through San Jose downtown against migration. Uh, so it's, it's and we have our own version of alt-right <laughs> politics, the, something like tropicalized alt-right. <laughs> uh, hard to believe, but we have. An, you can have a look in, in, in Facebook, and you will find alt-right Costa Rica uh, Facebook profile. So this 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 take of how a progressive politics for migration may look like is a pressing issue at the moment. Es bien interesante tu pregunta porque nosotros estamos viendo lo que pasa en nuestros países, estamos viendo lo que pasa en Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, México, pero no estamos viendo lo que está pasando acá, con la comunidad latina específicamente. Entonces ahora viene el censo y no importa si eres indocumentado, censate. Inscríbete en el censo para que haya más escuelas en tu área, para que haya más representantes latinos, etcétera, etcétera. Entonces, en las elecciones pasadas yo escuchaba que decían de que el voto latino iba a decidir el presidente de los Estados Unidos. Así nos engañan. Y los latinos creyendo que era cierto. Porque a nosotros no nos da una educación para ver números, para ver curvas ascendentes o descendentes, la nuestra va descendente, pero bueno. Y nos prestamos a los juegos para los que nosotros no estamos preparados. Pero tenemos muchas personas representando la comunidad latina que no nos están diciendo que nos están engañando porque ellos se van a tirar en las próximas elecciones, van a volver a correr. No les conviene. Mira, mi amor, aquí los temas son de conveniencia. En Honduras, por ejemplo, tenemos 
por primera vez en la historia creo que cinco representantes de la comunidad garífuna, o sea que son garífuna, no votaron por el, no, no, no llegaron ahí por el voto garífuna completo, entonces no se deben a la comunidad garífuna completa. Y lo mismo pasa en todos los países. El problema es que lo que manejan los políticos está en conjunto con lo que manejan los empresarios. El que tiene el dinero y el que tiene el poder se unen en contra de nosotros. Y nosotros terminamos bailando en las fiestas que ellos ponen. Tenemos que aprender a cambiar eso. Tenemos que empezar a decirle a la gente, si usted come maíz orgánico, frijoles orgánicos y café orgánico no tiene nada que venir a hacer a Estados Unidos a envenenarse con todos los químicos que le ponen a la comida para que venga desde su país a su mesa pero al político no le conviene porque si no tenemos suficientes migrantes no tenemos esa representación por ahí tenemos que ir viendo también qué está pasando aquí y cuál es otro de los problemas Right, I think we're going to go to our last question. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, so I guess my question is, you spoke a lot about um, working outside of the university space and the kind of isolated work that can happen there. And I guess for me, my question is, Uh, what role do you think first or second generation Latin Americans, Central Americans in the United States or people like me who've moved up to the United States and have kind of grown up here but have those deep ties to Central America? Like, What role do you think that they could play in um, expanding the narrative and adding to kind of that story of Central American migration to the United States? Yeah, well, I, I, I think you you may play, and you are playing uh, uh, a huge role. I mean, I think despite all this uh, radicalization of narratives of migration, there are also lots of effort trying to portray migration in different ways, uh, and this is this is quite important and, and this space is a is an, a case in point i mean that that now the i mean the conversation is is taking new ways of of trying to to offer different views of, of this topic and and i think that the the role played by first and second generation is quite important i mean is Um, I, I, I think that we, we uh, in, in the long run, it seems to me that progressive views have more probability to win public attention. I mean, the, in, in a way, maybe a paradox, but the the politi politicization of migration nowadays is a, is is a testimony of certain political forces that are losing power and they need to take the more radical positions in order to to in, to try to recover their own legitimacy It seems to me that sometimes it's difficult to to see that, but if if we if we frame the discussion in the long run, I I think we meaning by we those who feel in hospitality, solidarity, and conviviality, we we do have more probability to win the public consensus. Uh, And for that, I think we, we need to forge more solidarity networking, not only in, within specialized audiences, but also in wider audiences. And this is why, for instance, producing a documentary is a, is a, is a way of 
taking part in the in, in the more YouTube kind of culture. And if you have the number of visualization of the documentary for a non-commercial initiative, we, we are happy with that. We never, we won't never get that number of visualizations only doing more traditional university work. And how, uh, many, how many languages did you say the film is? Yeah, we, we, a number of different small groups have donated the translation of subtitles. Now we have subtitles in Spanish, in English, in French, in German, and French and Portuguese. And we only pay for the German subtitles. The rest were <laughs> contributions of different small groups that say, oh, we would like to offer, we, we can't put money, but we, we can offer our knowledge of being able to translate, translate from Spanish to French or English, Portuguese, uh, uh, and so on. So, the, I mean, this, this idea of, of that in the long run, the idea of being cosmopolitan could gain terrain, I think, is, is the, the horizon. And probably those who are persuading us that, that uh, we are, they, they are saying that they are winning and in the long run they are losing. Also, also in terms of demographics, it's, it's, it, there is no way. <laughs> Because just to speak for my own country, Costa Rica has the lowest fertility rate in Latin America. So Nicaraguans are going to be more and more prevalent in terms of culture, in terms of uh, uh, multicultural ways of living. And, and, and you can't change the demog demographics uh, for your own uh, will. It's the same case here. So, in, in, and this is the same case in Europe. Uh, the European Union experienced a similar situation. So, I think we, we can hope that in the long run, we are going to win. <laughs> You like the last word? <laughs> Every time I'm coming to these conversations, I advise. I talk a lot, and I know. <laughs> um, we need to think, think, nothing, think about this issue. And why now immigration is a big issue for this country, for Mexico, and for the other, other countries? Why, if we know that people, la gente migra por siempre, o ha emigrado por siempre, why now is a big issue? Why, and right now. So, yo quiero dejar ese pensamiento. ¿Por qué ahora es tan grande el problema? ¿Por qué ahora es tan grave? ¿Y a quiénes les conviene que continúe siendo un grave problema? No les dejo con una, un pensamiento mío, sino algo que yo quiero que ustedes empiecen a contestarnos a nosotros. Gracias. Hey, thank you so much. So I think at this time we do have a reception um, set up outside, and so we can continue this continue this conversation. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you.